I've been with Anthem for about a year and a half. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, this is the DMT Masterclass, so I'm going to kick it off by talking about the molecule itself, um, and, and di dimethyltryptamine. Um, this is, at its core, a tryptamine molecule. It's very similar structurally to serotonin. Um, we might hear sometimes about 5-MeO-DMT, that's 5-methoxy-DMT, a very interesting related molecule of, of the same class, but for today we're going to be talking about DMT itself. Um, this is uh, one of the classic uh, hallucinogens. We talk about um, serotonergics. We are usually talking about LSD, psilocybin, um, sometimes mescaline. They all share that same structural core and um, they, they share similar effects because they all operate on the serotonin receptor system, in particular the serotonin 2A receptor, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, as we know, DMT is extremely, um, probably the most powerful and potent among the classic psychedelics. Um, it's been used therapeutically for uh, hundreds if not thousands of years in indigenous communities uh, in, the, in the form of ayahuasca, uh, a tea that can be uh, drink. Um, it's been scientifically studied as a, as a sort of a pure chemical since about the 1950s. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done in plants, animals, and humans. It's actually present throughout the plant and animal kingdom in, um, in almost everything. Uh, it's endogenous to humans. Um, where we think it may act as a neurotransmitter. Um, that leads us to really support the fact that it is, is very safe to use in humans, and uh, especially important for therapeutic effects, it's very short-acting. So let's compare it a little bit to how these therapeutic advantages, using it in a clinical setting for mental health treatments, would be a, maybe an advantage over other classic psychedelics. So compared to, uh, the obvious one is, is the duration of effects compared to uh, ayahuasca or psilocybin. Um, it's a very short acting molecule. As I'll talk about in a second, it's half-life is only about five minutes. So it's very rapidly metabolized in the body. Um, as opposed to psilocybin, um, you know, you might be spending the day, right? Six to eight hours, uh, sometimes longer depending on the drug. And when you're in for a very long trip, sometimes you have a, a limited means of sort of ending if you're having an adverse reaction. This also can lead to lack of precise, precise dosing control because once you're in it, you're in it. And it can be difficult to scale in, in terms of, uh, you know, if you're trying to get people into a clinic and you need to really spend the whole day, it's really hard to, to, to really treat as many people as you might want to. So DMT offers a shorter session length, in particular an intravenous infusion, which is what Entheon is trying to do, uh, bring into the clinic. Um, that allows a lot of flexibility. You can infuse as long as you'd like. Uh, this allows for shorter session lengths, maybe as short as 30 minutes. And more importantly, the ability to end the session very quickly. Uh, think of a big red stop button that the patient or the physician can hit to, to bring the patient back to um, baseline um, quite quickly. Um, this also allows one to titrate or modify the dose as you go through and allows more patients can, can be treated per day in a clinic. Um, and the hope is that we could potentially spend less time in a psychedelic state, or at least as short of a time to really provide um, the maximal impact. So um, getting into the science a little bit, I think I won't really like nerd out too much here, but I do want to compare some of these properties and introduce you to DMT and what it's doing in the body. Um, so we know it has this sort of uh, higher activation of serotonin 2A receptors compared to other psychedelics. And if we look at the potency on the receptor, it's about 10 times higher than psilocybin. Um, we can look at the maximal activation, the percent of the receptors activated, um, it's about twice as high with DMT over psilocybin. So it is, it is quite potent. Um, as I mentioned, it says about a half-life of about five minutes compared to about 50 minutes for psilocybin. So that, that allows this real-time clearance once you turn off the, the drip, as it were. Um, and other than the serotonergic effect, um, as we'll hear later in the in sessions today, um, really fascinating stuff happening outside um, the brain, um, it, both inside and outside the brain, I guess. Um, uh, DMT affects plasticity and neurons. Um, uh, new hippocampal neurons can be formed. Um, it also increases dendritic spine density, arborization of dendrites, as you can see in this beautiful image here from courtesy of the uh, UC Davis labs that have published some really cool stuff um, looking at neurogenesis. Um, there are also neuroprotective effects in the body uh, via sigma-1 receptors um, that can lead to anti-inflammatory and ischemic properties. So there's a really a lot of exciting potential for DMT. Um, what is the experience? Um, well, far be it for me to try to describe what DMT is like, but um, many experiences report similar phenomenon, very, very visual, um, vivid visual imagery, 
um, a very powerful range of emotions, but most importantly, this clarity of insight into one's relationships, emotions, and it can really lead to this dismantling of deeply held beliefs. Um, and this is where we think that the change can really happen therapeutically. Um, neuro neurophysiologically, we see in the brain, we can record what happens during DMT, and, and uh, Chris Timmerman's gonna talk us through a little more about that research. But what we see in general is a, a decrease in, in what they call alpha power in the brain and, um, in, and uh, EEG signaling, which is correlated with the visual activation. Uh, we also see greater entropy, this disruption of this default mode network, um, increased plasticity, increased connections, um, and more recently, the cortical traveling waves um, seem to be reversed in the brain. Um, as DMT uh, comes in, you see this alpha drop, you see this cortical traveling wave reversal. And this, this we think is related to changes in predictive coding, which is a, a model by the Carhart-Harris group that, that, that suggests that our kind of a model of reality is, is constantly being referenced against a, uh, an internal reference. And, and these drugs can kind of disrupt that and, and allow for plastic uh, change to happen.